everybody. It's Rob Seaver, Executive Director with Leeds Council. I'm bringing you, I think, the third edition of this stir shaking and call blocking webinar. It just continues to get better. We are joined today with some esteemed panelists. I want to get those introductions out of the way and then we'll quickly move into the nuts and bolts of this thing. I'm going to move it to one of my favorite people. I can't say my favorite because Bobby will get offended, but one of my favorite, my favorite, Michelle Schuster. Would you please tell us what you do and 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 what uh, why are you here today? You know, I ask myself that question all the time, uh, but uh, I'm Michelle Schuster. I'm a partner at the law firm of McMurray and Schuster. I'm a former uh, consumer protection chief from the Ohio Attorney General's office and uh, have been working in the telecommunications, telemarketing, advertising, marketing uh, compliance world for a long, we'll just say a long time now, otherwise I'll just sound old. Uh, and uh, I'm really happy to be here and uh, looking forward to talking about Stir Shaken. Awesome. I am too. And I'm going to move it over to my real favorite, Bobby Hakimi. <laughs> Bobby, thank you for joining us today. Give us a little bit about who you are and what you do with Comboso. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm, I'm Bobby Hakimi, uh, Chief Product Officer at Comboso, and I'm uh, working very closely on products as well as uh, some of these solutions and um, issues we're having with call blocking, Stir Shaken. And I work very closely with um, our customers as well as you know, looking to, at trends, seeing where the market goes and providing a solution that works for everybody, not just uh, you know, uh, consumers, but also making sure it works for our uh, customers and still um, solves the consumer's concerns regarding call blocking and getting harassed and so forth. Can't wait to get further into that. I know that you know everything about this stuff, and so I'm excited about it. And I'm not going to leave my best bud over there, Ryan Thurman with DNC.com, call center compliance. Ryan, give us a little bit about what you, who you are and what you do there. Sure. Thanks, Rob. So uh, our company's uh, DNC.com. Been in the space for probably 20 years. I lost track after 10. Um, helped companies from not getting sued for TCPA, and we help them get their calls through and make sense of this whole madness. Awesome. And can you help me just kind of kick start off? What are we talking about, and what are those things out there that are most important? Sure, absolutely. And uh, stir shaking is uh, one thing that is very important right now. If you are a call originator, uh, if you're working with call originators, if you're a voice service provider, if you're a contact center, just so critically important that you understand stir shaking and what it's gonna to take to get your calls through to the intended recipients under this new Stir Shaken framework. So what is Stir Shaken? Uh, you know, fundamentally, it's uh, a uh, call authentication network that works on IP-based networks. And uh, through the network and uh, uh, the carriers, in essence, are um, providing a certificate for calls that are placed on the network. So they sign calls. And I'll get to uh, what that means here in a minute. And they validate that calls are being placed by uh, specific uh, entities and uh, that, they, uh, that that specific entity has the right to use the phone call or the phone number uh, uh, that they're calling from and using on their caller ID to place those calls. And the reason that Stir Shaken uh, is here today is because uh, the FCC and consumer protection agencies identified illegal robocalls as one of the most important and critical uh, consumer protection issues. It's always uh, at the top of the list of consumer complaints, both for the FCC, the FCC, and state AGs. And so Stir Shaken was the answer from those regulators to help combat those illegal robocalls. So how does it work? So as I said, uh, calls are signed uh, by the originating carriers of telephone calls. Uh, and when they're signed, they receive an attestation level. That level can either be an A, a B, or a C attestation level. A is the highest attestation uh, level, and that's what you're going to want for your calls and we'll, we'll explain why that's so important here in a moment. Um, but an A attestation means the call is fully attested to. The carrier has confidence in the identity of the caller, and the caller has the right to use the caller ID information that they're, uh, that they're passing through the network. Uh, a level B attestation is a partial attestation, uh, and that means that a carrier has confidence in uh, the identity of the caller, but not the caller's right to use uh, the caller ID information. Um, 
So uh, this can happen in enterprise situations uh, where a um, secondary carrier potentially is uh, originating a call. So if you've gotten your call numbers from AT&T, but as a overflow network, you're using uh, uh, Comcast or some other carrier, uh, that could end up in a B attestation. And then there's a C-level attestation, which is a gateway attestation. Uh, this is uh, where a carrier can't identify the caller or the right to use caller ID. Lowest level of attestation. Uh, and this is something that you're going to see if uh, you're using legacy equipment that would strip a uh, certificate or an attestation or things like uh, international telephone calls. Uh, so that, that rating process is important uh, because uh, the telecom carriers use what's uh, commonly referred to as analytics companies. And those analytics companies are analyzing calls that come through the carrier network and determine if they should be labeled or blocked. And so in the stir shaken uh, network, this attestation level is going to be one factor that the analytics companies consider uh, when determining if calls should be labeled or blocked. So if you're not working to get uh, an A-level attestation, uh, it is more likely that your calls will be labeled or blocked. Uh, having said that, even with an A-level attestation, uh, it doesn't mean your call will get through. Even if they know who you are and why you're calling and you have the right to use the caller ID, uh, those analytics companies could still determine that your call is an unwanted uh, or an illegal call and uh, not allow those calls to go through. And that's something that uh, Bobby and Ryan will be elaborating on. So, so Michelle, you know, I remember when we first talked, actually, I think the first time I, I ever met you uh, in Arizona at a dnc.com conference, you started talking about this. And this was three or so years ago, maybe. I don't re I remember it, but uh, uh, the date. But I do remember that it was coming and it was coming. So, so help me understand the timeline for this. Is this actually happening? And uh, if so, like when did that happen? And, and what are the next steps for this thing? Yeah, yeah. So the wheels were set in motion for this probably back in 2016. So when did we meet, Rob? Probably sometime around then. Years yeah. ago, years ago. <laughs> Decades ago. Uh, and so uh, it became formalized, though, with the TRACE Act, which was passed at the end of 2019. Uh, the TRACE Act has mandated that telecom carriers implement stir shaken by uh, June 30th of 2021, which is coming up very quickly. Were there other efforts? I remember something with the FCC, I believe, that there were even side initiatives or efforts to directly go to the telecom companies for for call blocking is this is this in it as an extension of stir shaken or was that a separate issue um so um analytics companies have been around for a while so the labeling and blocking that's been happening is separate from stir shaken but stir shaken is one factor that's uh, considered as those calls are being labeled and blocked i just i'm trying to understand um you know, we, I think it's confusing for a lot of people out there as we talk about, and I think Bobby, you know, I can, I can also bring you into this. St where you, you had a lot of, uh, you used the word att attestation. I, I struggle with that. And I think everybody uh, that is four years deep into whatever conversation they're in uh, would struggle with that. But, um, you know, you're talking about a whole set of rules that have been set to the, um, the carriers but it doesn't is call blocking different bobby help me out with this call blocking is different is that is that right or is it the same no it is different and uh what michelle said is correct they're using a lot of data points to figure out if that call uh, should get blocked or flagged right so right now they're just using a lot of data they're looking at the amount of calls that are being placed in a short period of time if uh, consumers are um flagging them or rejecting them at a certain period um or you know if they're um, I mean, there's a lot of data points they're looking at, and using that data, they essentially um, have this algorithm, and um, you know they flag the call as a telemarketer scam, spam, and so what uh, T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT&T have done is they've teamed up uh, individually with uh, a private company, 
and that company has access to all their call logs. And what they're doing is they're analyzing all that data and based on their algorithms, they see, okay, so um, this number has called X amount of people in a, you know, days, period, weeks, month, and so forth. And using that data, they're uh, essentially labeling the um, caller ID as spam, scam. And so what's happening is uh, these uh, applications were first independent applications that they provided to these uh, to T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT&T. And what they now recently did is they took that data and um, plugged it into their own blocking uh, application. So um, a lot of people may have realized recently they've gotten text message from the carrier saying, hey, click here to uh, enable uh, spam blocking. And so before that, there was an independent application that was used and now they're integrating it into their uh, service. And so more and more people are starting to enable that which um, which is a big problem because I don't know if you guys noticed, I've gotten calls from the bank and it says spam, you know, and I don't even know if I should pick up on it anymore or not. So that future is really not working, but that's that's the first attempt at it. And uh, stir shaking will be another data point uh, to use to see if that, you know, if that call is, uh, you know, should go through or not. I, I want to stick with you, Bobby, because I mean, obviously you, um, help develop the Convoso platform. Um, and I think you were instrumental in that in your role, but what should somebody be asking of their dialer platform today as it relates to this type of stuff? Because I, I have to, I mean, I have to believe it's confusing one. And we also know that a lot of people just don't even know they're being blocked at this point. And we are seeing, I suspect, a dip in engagement. Is, is that what's happening? And then Subsequently, like I said, what what should you be asking of your dialer platform? Great question. Um, yes, yeah, so it is an incremental, small but still incremental um, decline in contact rate, and we've seen that you know time after time. Uh, it's not very drastic. So if you look at you know a year's worth of data, we've seen that inc incrementally go up. Um, but what, what I would ask is, um, have they implemented stir shake? And if they haven't, when are they planning on implementing it? And um, another question is. Um, are they able to implement it? If they are not the carrier, then they can't sign the calls themselves. They'll be um, using a third party or uh, the carrier that they are using to place the calls will be then signing those um, the, the calls that they're placing out. And that's also a big problem because like Michelle said, um, if you aren't signing the calls, then the best rating you'll get is at best B. And even B um, may not happen because if if say the vendor is using uh, multiple carriers and they're just, you know, one of their smaller customers, I don't see them really signing a B rating. They're just, you know, probably give them a C because they know, all right, well, this is a client of ours, but we don't know much about them. We don't know about their customers. So I would ask them, how are they getting these signed? And if they aren't a CLAC or a carrier, um, what are they doing about it to ensure they at least get a B rating? And then the other big question I have is, for all those open source platforms, with the, which there's tons of them, what are they doing? Because again, if you're not implementing it, then you're gonna be using a carrier. And then, and, and if it's a carrier that you're using, you're gonna have the same problem. Um, so I'd be asking how are they, um, you know, how are they getting that signed? And then what are their plans for um, monitoring uh, the call blocking issue? Uh, with us, for example, we have a proprietary technology where we monitor uh, T-Mobile, Verizon, and t and right now. And we've been monitoring all of our uh, numbers at Convulso, and it's interesting, um, the data that we're getting out of it, and also the labels. I mean, I've seen, I'm see, I've seen them label account services as the call ID. I don't even understand. That's not even uh, call blocking, right? So they're adding more and more labels. And so I would ask them, do they have something like that? Um, as well as now Google is getting into the space as well, which is very interesting. They have uh, something called call verification and uh, we've, we've partnered up with them to build out, the, build out the technology and ensure that it works for consumers as well as uh, vendors. And so they're planning on rolling that out globally by the end of uh, 2022. And so we're beta testing it right now with them. And it's very interesting because what they're doing now is uh, uh, vetting vendors um, they have the ability now to put up a logo. So um, when the person gets a call, they'll see, um, you know, a logo, Home Depot, whoever. And then the reason for why they're calling, that's also another 
uh, attribute they can add. And then um, obviously those calls are verified, so they're not going to get blocked. So that's what uh, Google is doing. And then we have other systems like uh, RoboKiller, No More Robo, and you know a lot of other applications out there trying to do the same thing. But I, I literally, and you probably can't see it, but while we were talking, uh, Verizon just uh, blocked a call for potential spam. Um, yeah. You know, and I also know, you know, from a, so what you're saying, like on the third party side, I remember I, I, I just inherited my mother-in-law who has dementia's phone and I was looking at all of the potential um, election text messages that were coming through. And, and uh, so what I did was I just went into the iOS and I literally said, if you're not in her contact list, I don't want to be bothered. Is, is that what the industry is facing today? Just a hodgepodge? Is, is that what we're up against? I mean, you know, that's that's very drastic, right? So um, if you were to do that, you're going to miss a lot of calls. You're going to get calls from different numbers, from different areas like banks uh, or, or, you know, notifications from CVS. So that's not going to be scalable. And, you know, people may try that and they'll start seeing they're missing um, calls or text messages. Ultimately, what's going to happen is um, all calls or text messages will be registered. So one of the things are uh, that um, customers should be doing is um, they should be registering their numbers with the three vendors that are teaming up with uh, these carriers. And by law, you have the ability to register your numbers and whitelist them which is, uh, again, that's what you, you, that's the ability you should have, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to upsell you on it to say, well, you can whitelist it, but it may not stay whitelisted and you may start getting uh, blocked again, but if you want, pay us and we'll um, ensure that your number never gets blocked and you put a name on there, which is a little bit crazy to me because if, we're, if, if I'm a legit business, I should be able to place calls to my customers and I shouldn't have to pay to call them. So that's a big uh, problem right now that these companies are taking advantage of by, you know, essentially telling people, well, you know, you can whitelist it, but it's not guaranteed. But if you want to guarantee it, pay. So that's are there big companies problem. out there that can guarantee attestation? Um, and anybody on the on the call can 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 that happen? Well, I mean, so we're, we're registered as a carrier and for us, we have the ability to give a rating, but even us, we wouldn't get, give a rating unless we know the customer uh, and it's appropriate for us to do that because, um, and Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a liability with a rating, right? Meaning if, if, if we uh, sign a call with a rating and they do something illegal, we're on a hook. We're, yeah. we're essentially, right? There's a fine uh, associated with it. And you can also lose your access to the network, which obviously ends right. your business, uh, so it can be pretty pretty substantial. Right, so you know, I don't see a lot of people getting A at the station unless there's a uh, you know, thorough uh, audit of the customer to see what they're doing, who they're calling, and continuously monitoring the customer. Ryan, I'm gonna get to you in a second. I know you're chomping at the bits, but I have to leave a good window for you and I to chat. Um, Bobby, did you say, and I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm reading some of the questions, which we have a ton of questions. So panelists, if you would like to also open your questions uh, panel, um, uh, section of your panel open, uh, there are a ton of them over there that we're getting. Um, did you say, Bobby, that you guys actually can start identifying when a call has been blocked? Is that is that real? Correct. We um, have the ability of uh, figuring out if right now it works with T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT&T. So we have we've built a technology where we can identify um, if they're getting blocked and what the label is. And it's a beta program which we're um, pushing out to selective customers right now. Um, but yeah, that's that's the, and then uh, in the future we're gonna monitor uh, Nomo Robo, Robo Killer, and then some of the other major applications. But currently it's uh, T-Mobile and Sprint. Which are, which are one Verizon and AT and T. I would imagine if you're in a call center and 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 you know this is a thing now, you're going to have to require that at some level out of your your dialer platform. Um, Ryan, I, I want to move over to you and you know you live in Northern California and the last time you and I talked, I believe you were almost late because you were up at three o'clock in the morning fighting fires. So help me understand here, what is the impact of all of this call blocking and, and what's going on as it relates to not only the call center, but even the consumer? 
Well, that's the, that's the thing that it's it's not just, you know, with like TCPA and do not call type issues where it's like you're just making outbound calls or notifications. It's it's beyond that, that the, the call block and labels impact in terms of like uh, emergency notifications, calls from uh, legitimate organizations are being blocked and interpreted incorrectly because um, to what Bobby was talking about with the analytics companies, they're trying to anticipate what a robocall is. They're trying to anticipate, you know, quote, illegal traffic, but they're also trying to give consumers choice and, and make it so that they have an option for, you know, kind of protecting their own privacy from these suspect calls. And essentially what seems to have happened is that they've jumped the gun on the technology that got leaked out and they've got poor uh, machine learning and AI that's basically giving a lot of false positive results. And so, You've got like the consumer side where it's like you're expecting a call from somebody, whether it's you know Comcast, who their number keeps coming up as scam like when they call me, or you know if it's emergency services, you've got a lot of these calls that are being interrupted and blocked, and it's like what can you do about it once that happens? That ultimately is, is really the, the question. And um, there's the there's kind of three stages of companies when they or three stages a company kind of goes through when they engage us to kind of look at like how bad is this problem? Because we have a similar type of solution to Bobby where we can peer into the networks and with Convoso, uh, at least on our system where they can go in and get an idea of like what's happening with their phone numbers. That's usually the first stage is like figuring out how bad this is or validating that it's actually happening, right? Because you might have reps that are telling you, hey, this guy says we're coming up scam likely. Uh, or you might see your call rec uh, connectivity decrease, right? You can start getting a lot of busy signals, a lot of excess, uh, no answers, voicemails. And the natural thing to do is start blaming people, right? You start blaming your data company, your lead source. Then you go, okay, maybe something's wrong with the dialer. And you know, you haven't changed anything. You're using same technology, same lead source, but you're using the same caller ID numbers or numbers that basically have come with some baggage. So it's about trying to detect that that's going on, then it's okay, now we've figured out we have a problem. We know a certain set of numbers here are constantly running hot, or we can't we can't shed this negative reputation, so then what do you do? And you really have a couple options. One is you change the behavior, you change the amount of dialing, the velocity, the cadence, um, you even things out, you rotate new numbers in that are clean, but sooner or later, especially if you're in lead gen, that's gonna catch up to you pretty quickly and you'll have these campaigns where you got a new lead coming in, newer phone numbers, and all of a sudden they're being blocked quickly. So then it might not just be something you can change behavioral, it could be something where you need to uh, look at your kind of overall caller ID strategy and or include some level of kind of whitelisting in that process. And that's the part that we just started to really get into as far as like, Taking a customer, we vet them out, make sure they're they own the numbers they have, but then help them go into these multiple analytic companies because it's a headache and a lot of people want to go mess around with it. And but at the same time, they want to keep some of these phone numbers. Um, and then it's also really looking at what else could be causing this issue. And one of the things that has been happening more and more is the spoofing or the hijacking of numbers. Right? You get a, a company um, that grabs somebody's other information, they start running legal traffic or try to ride on their coattails. Um, Michelle's probably got a good example of that she's talked about before, but basically that'll also cause your score to go up. So I've got customers that are looking at trying to figure out how to monitor and even whitelist their own uh, inbound numbers so that they can kind of figure out, you know, that they essentially what numbers they want to keep and get the carriers on board where they'll they'll know what kind of traffic they're seeing from um, let's say you know at and or whoever and then they can go hey this is the traffic they told us about these are the phone numbers they're using so they'll dial down that um, negative listing out there um, and that's the part that you know essentially is it's it's a lot of heavy lifting because unfortunately, like Bobby was saying, it's it's not just one entity. It's not a national database. It'd be nice if we have one place we could go source this info, but it's it's coming from multiple sources. And then you've got these app players that are kind of living in their own realm. Um, they're fairly unregulated. They can essentially um, tag records and they allow customers or consumers to 
input that information. And so it seems like the app companies, when they get data that from their consumers, it's virtually, you know, uh, uh, all of their, uh, you know, reports on numbers or just they're reporting everything because they don't want any kind of calls. And these are people that are, you know, they owe the IRS money or they, you know, aren't necessarily always, you know, financially sound. And so they're just, you know, getting, getting a lot of calls from collections. And so you see, see that happening, but it, it's just that the fact that it's happening on ed, multiple industries and with all different types of calls that I think the phenomenon is just, it's not just your sales calls or your outreach, to your customers. It's like all the way across the board, whereas like, you look at you know the other type of regulations that we deal with with TCPA and DNC, typically is dealing only with you know outbound sales calls and engagement at that level. But that's why I think this is a bigger issue, and there's you know more more at stake here, which is why eventually I mean start shaking. That's that's the goal is get these calls authenticated so that you don't have this false labeling. But we don't know how that's going to pan out. I mean, there's still going to I think be some mm -hmm. degree of uh, false lane because this, like I said, this technology that whatever they're using seems to be um, pushed out before it's ready for prime time. Michelle, um, you know, both on call blocking, but specifically yeah. stir shaking, was there a particular technology that was called out or were there a particular platform, i.e. Um, landline versus mobile, or was this just across the board? Help me understand that a little bit. Well, before I, before I answer that question, Rob, you know, a really great example of that, Ryan, and I think about you and I think about this example with the wildfires in uh, Northern California, uh, we saw a news story last month that, um, that Northern California residents had signed up to receive notifications when evacuation orders were, uh, were put out. And so the company that was issuing those evacuation orders was sending out pre-recorded messages to say, uh, you know, uh, emergency situation, please evacuate immediately or something to that effect. And so if you think about that call, it looks a lot like a robocall, right? It's, it's a pre-recorded message. It's a lot of calls made. It's a short duration call. Uh, and, and those are um, some of the attributes that robocalls have. And so these analytics companies, when they're looking at these calls, uh, and when they looked at these in particular, they said, you know what, this is a robocall and we have to block these. So the carriers blocked these calls that were being sent out to uh, tell people that they needed to evacuate. So, you know, these systems are not anywhere near uh, perfect. Um, and as uh, both Bobby and Ryan have, have said, uh, in, there is accountability, I guess, to the um, FCC, but the FCC has issued um, safe harbor rules for the carriers and the analytics companies, as long as they're blocking based on some type of reasonable analytics uh, without reasonable being um, defined. So, um, and they have uh, the ability to block by default. The FCC issued that order a few, uh, maybe a year and a half ago now. So um, the favor has been to uh, default to any type of blocking and labeling that's gonna help prevent this robocall problem. Uh, the concern and, and the real problem is the point I just made illustrates or the example illustrates is that there will be uh, calls that will be um, blocked that are going to cause real harm to consumers. And it, just thinking about your situation, Rob, in, a, uh, you know, in meetings with the FCC, we've brought up examples like that. Somebody who um, goes to their iOS and blocks all calls that aren't in their uh, in their contacts. And so, uh, you know, what happens is you'll have a loved one that's traveling and maybe internationally traveling. So now we've got a call coming in through an international gateway. Uh, so it's going to get a C or the lowest level attestation. And uh, it's going to come to your call They're not gonna, or your phone. It's not going to be in your contacts. And that call is not going to get through to you. So you miss an emergency phone call. Uh, about uh, a loved one that's been hurt overseas. So, um, you know, all kinds of examples like that, um, but um, the um, consistent type of a response that we've gotten from a number of different, uh, uh, you know, companies and, and regulators that we've talked about this is that you can't protect consumers from themselves. So Rob, uh, that, that comment was intended for you. You can't protect yourself uh, if, <laughs> if you're blocking all of those types of calls that aren't in your contacts. Uh, so, you know, it's going to lead to it some... It was my mother-in-law. It may be intentional. I don't know. I'm just, you know. <laughs> that sounds like a personal problem we won't deal with here, but... Uh, but but it just it just illustrates the point. I mean, this is a this is a real issue that contactors really need to 
or, or call originators really start need to start working with uh, vendors to make sure their calls are getting through. Uh, and, and just one last point, uh, I'm general counsel for PACE and we have been advocating on this issue for years now. And uh, you know, the one thing that we, that we have consistently asked is that there be transparency in this process. So if calls are being labeled or if they're being blocked, the call originator needs to know. So there needs to be uh, some type of signal code that's provided to them, either a, something like a tritone in a busy signal or uh, some type of code that's returned to them so that they know that it's happening because the problem is now they don't know it's happening unless uh, you know, Bobby or Ryan are telling them uh, that those those types of uh, things are happening. And then they need to have the ability to redress those issues. And so there's multiple carriers. You heard Bobby rattle off a whole host of, of different vendors that assist with the blocking. Uh, if you have to go to all of those different, uh, different uh, uh, businesses uh, to try to figure out and to stop the blocking and labeling, it's a pretty, uh, you know, onerous task that you're faced with. So, uh, anyway, Rob, I think you asked a question at the beginning of that, but I can't for the life of me. I, I have no idea what I asked, but um, uh, thank you for answering. There you <laughs> I appreciate go. that, um, Bobby. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to move on to you very quickly. Um, first of all, can we verify our numbers? And then also, there was a side question somebody asked about you know, um, does this uh, mobile versus landline, but also this applies to text messaging as well, right? Right, so <clears throat> what um, all the carriers are now doing, and it's uh, it's with AT&T and T-Mobile, they signed up already. Um, there is a registry service where you have to now register your numbers and um, you can't register more than, uh, I guess a couple hundred numbers at most per campaign. So what they're saying is, um, or what, well, let me go backwards. What people started doing is in order to not get blocked uh, by text messages, they started buying, you know, a thousand, two thousand numbers, and they started using those numbers to to text message. And that's been going on for years. So now the carriers caught up and said, nope, that's it. We're not doing that anymore. The most you can do is you can have X amount. You have to register for a campaign ID. You have to uh, add those numbers to that campaign ID, and we're going to only allow X amount of messages a second for that campaign, and that's it. So we're, we, um, we're probably gonna have a webinar coming up very shortly with that company as well to uh, address that, explain how that works. And we're setting up a system where our customers can register their numbers as they purchase them, they automatically get registered, uh, the campaign gets created. So we're working with that uh, entity to um, figure out how to make it work for everybody because that's again, a lot of work, just like the other uh, vendors that are uh, providing the blocking mechanisms for uh, the mobile carriers. Now there's one for uh, a text message, but at least it's one entity doing it for all carriers. So um, like I said before, I, I can foresee that in the future, um, what's gonna happen is your vendors have to sign up and team up and partner up with these uh, companies and um, have some kind of a uh, integration where um, as numbers are purchased, they get registered with these entities. So. Um, fortunately for the text messaging, they're open, they have an API and they're, they're not looking to make money. They're just looking to register and understand who the uh, customer is, have some basic information. So in case something happens, we can figure out who's sending the text messages. But uh, with the call blocking right now, it's a, it's a big problem. Uh, I mean, registering them, it's a nightmare. I try to do it personally for one customer just to learn and see the experience and it's not scalable. Um, not only that, every time you get a new number, what do you have to do? You have to go to three, enti three entities, um, register, follow up, make sure it's working. There's no portal where you can see what's happening. So um, I can foresee in the future something happening where everybody just has to register the numbers. And with stir shaking, a lot of that um, should help because the big problem is everybody's uh, blasting calls and text messages and nobody knows who it is. Because you can, you can spoof a text message as well. I can, as a carrier, technically send a text message uh, and change the call ID where the text message, text message comes from and uh, take advantage of that, right? So as stir shaking gets rolled out more and more, there'll be accountability. And I think the blocking uh, mechanisms are gonna be uh, less intrusive, but we'll, we'll see, time will tell. I can, I can ask this one question, it was uh, from the audience, and I think that this is important to make sure that there's no confusion around this. Consent on the opt-in is not what we're talking about, right? Like that, that there's no correlation between opt-in consent and whether or not the number gets blocked. Is that correct? Correct. You can have opt-in data, 
you'll still get blocked if you don't register if you don't have a, a vendor that can monitor it and you know help help you register your numbers i keep saying register <laughs> um but yeah it's it's they just they don't have a way of identifying if this call or text message is if they're valid often or not it's the same problem now what some of these entities are starting to do is asking for um, opt-in data. For example, uh, the Trace Act, uh, we've worked with them several times where they saw a large volume of calls and they said, you know, they came to us and Michelle uh, worked with us on some of those cases where they're like, well, this is not possible. How are they able to place this many calls? And, you know, we have to go through this intensive process to prove to them, here it is. This is the opt-in data. This is the proof. The, you know, this is a big company. They're spending a lot of money on leads. They are calling this and it's legitimate. So we had to go back and forth constantly uh, to get them off our back. But then, um, like Ryan said, we're having tons of requests uh, coming in where, uh, you know, our uh, uh, complaints are coming in saying this number is uh, uh, doing illegal activities and calling XYZ. And so we look in our uh, monitoring system and our logs and we see we've never called this number. So it was, it was spoofing, right? Somebody took a legitimate number and they start spoofing it. Um, so it's, it's a mess. Overall, it's, you know, there's a lot of issues from multiple directions. So, so if I had tax problems and I thought, okay, the best way to deal with this is to call the IRS, is that very similar? There was a question that was asked um, by one of our board members or ex-board members, but uh, still part of the family, Jeff Fewer. Um, uh, do I need to pick up the phone and call the carrier? Or is it best to work with somebody who already has an established dialogue, knows what they're talking about? Um, you know, any three, I mean, I see all three of you kind of shaking your head yes or no, but I don't know what you're shaking your head yes or no to. Um, I think Michelle should I call the carrier? <laughs> or, I mean, what, what, what's the recommendation? What's that, Michelle? Oh, asking me if I wanted lunch. Uh, no, oh. I just... <laughs> um, so, um, if it's just... If for, I was shaking my head no because I thought the question was just for an individual, uh, you know, making a telephone call, wanting to call the IRS, do you need to talk to Gary? No, you don't. Individuals <laughs> do not need to worry about these types of issues. You are not going to get flagged I'm, by I'm the... I'm talking about the business side of it, yes. <laughs> Unless you're doing something crazy there, uh, but uh, you know, absolutely, um, reaching out to your carriers is the first step. Uh, you need to find out what they're doing. You need to find out what they're requiring. Uh, they need information in order to provide you with an A-level attestation, as Bobby was discussing with the way that he's uh, working to certify uh, his customers that are using their systems. And as a voice service provider, um, Bobby's Bobby's able to do that. Uh, so. Uh, whoever it is that you're working with, if it's a contact center, you might want to start with a contact center. If you're the actual call originator, then go directly to your carrier. If you have questions after this, I'm sure Bobby or Ryan or I would be happy to, to work with you. But um, just, Rob, going back to something that Bobby said that he, he kind of um, glossed over quickly, and it is so important because it really is why we have Stir Shaken. And um, the Trace Act created a group called the Industry Traceback Group. And the Industry Traceback Group group is charged with investigating uh, claims that calls are being made that are uh, illegal. And uh, as the name implies, it traces back where those calls come from, find out who is uh, placing those telephone calls, and then stop the telephone calls if they truly are illegal. And so at the heart of Stir Shaken, because it's providing a way to track through uh, through these digital signs that are issued, who's placing those telephone calls, the traceback group can do that. And so um, uh, providers that are uh, hosting uh, platforms for placing calls are now receiving you know, lots of requests from uh, the industry traceback group. And it has recently issued rules about how it's gonna handle the complaints. And if the complaints are validated that uh, a provider is hosting what they call bad traffic or illegal calls, uh, then they can be fined, and as I said, they can lose access to uh, the the telecom network. So it's uh, it, it's a it's a significant uh, penalty that that can occur. Also, um, we're starting to see state AGs get much more active in this area. So uh, with the uh, combination of stir shaking that identifies who's who's placing telephone calls, and then with the traceback group that can investigate those. And they are they are sharing the information that they learn with the regulators. 
uh, then we have an enforcement mechanism. And that's what was missing before. Fundamentally, the problem with the uh, the, the VoIP system of telephone calls is you couldn't identify who was who was uh, placing the telephone calls. Trust had been lost in that in that network, and a lot of bad actors taking advantage of that. Ryan, um, when we talk about labeling and whitelisting, um, does whitelisting get rid of the labeling, or how does that work? I, I have I have very little understanding about this. It, it doesn't necessarily get rid of it 100 percent, but it helps. It's it helps in the sense that when the carriers or see your traffic and if what you told them aligns as far as like your call times, your velocity, your duration of message um, with with kind of what's been vetted out, because it's another part of, part of the process, it'll dial down those those labeling and blocking issues to an extent. And that's kind of why you need to kind of pair up any sort of whitelisting registration servers. To, I usually recommend hiring a company because like I said, it's a headache to do, but also because the same way you want to pair that up with some sort of monitoring to make sure it's working and make sure if something changes, you don't have a number all of a sudden go hot or go rogue. Because it's really, um, it's really about the ability to kind of monitor this stuff real time. Like what happened to your number a week ago or 10 days ago, it's not, might not be a good future indicator of what it's going to be uh, the next time that, that, that you light up a phone number. I mean, the one thing that at least we've learned, at least a couple of things we've learned in dealing with the analytics companies, I think is helpful is that first off, they, like Michelle was talking about, they look for these kind of signals that it's um, bad traffic. So if it's like, um, erratic or abnormal patterns they actually like regularity which is interesting because it almost like lends it to using convoso and using more of a system um they don't like people when they switch numbers out all the time they can see that behavior i mean that's you talk to anybody in the contact center biz and they've got some sort of strategy around uh i call it like the plain card number charades right they're throwing different numbers out they change them every day but if you do do that too often, they can see that, but you're also paying for those numbers. So if you're paying for excess numbers, um, that can be some benefit. But the other thing is that, and this one is probably the more helpful tip, is that the history that, that the analyst companies keep on phone numbers is limited. They're not looking six months back. So you really have about a 15 to 30 day window. Like if you have a number that goes hot, and it's just continually getting tagged. If you pull it offline, you don't use it, nobody's spoofing it, the, the history will reset itself. And that's one thing that um, can be helpful is just looking at your, your patterns. And then the other one that seems to, to have worked well, at least from our, what our, some of my customers has told me is that they try to make their contact center almost appear that they're making, humans are making the calls, that it's not mm -hmm. a machine, that they, you know, it's it's not a it's not using any sort of dialer where they'll have buckets of numbers that they'll use per agent. So instead of a shared pool across the whole contact center, across a whole large enterprise, they'll distill it down to, you know, five DIDs for one rep, five for another, and then they'll kind of use those because then, especially if they're really not using a dialer, they're trying to stay off of TCPA issues. Um, when those reps make the calls, you know, reps are fairly consistent. They usually work the same time every day. So it kind of establishes those kind of traffic patterns. And those are some things that uh, can be helpful. And then just as far as like TCPA goes, we're, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of activity where, you know, clients are telling me they've done everything possible to try to block some of these folks from getting in their networks. But it seems that some of these TCPA serial actors are also using some of the spoofing technology so that when they go in and opt into leads, they're not always giving you a correct phone number or they come in under a, you know, a non litigator number, but then when you call them back or when they ask you to follow up, now they've got other numbers in the pool. So that's the other thing to be aware of is it's just the technology's out there. So, you know, make sure you're, you're kind of looking at, at both angles there. Bobby, um, I know that people routinely text and call and email and tweet, whatever their attempt is. Um, we call that 
probably omni-channel, right? I mean, I hate to, to bring that word up because sometimes it's so confusing, but at the same point, I would imagine it's important for a platform to be able to monitor and track all of that activity to be able to potentially one point out that there might be blocking going on in your text messaging campaign versus your call campaign. Um, help me understand, am I right or am I on the right track on that? Or what do you look for uh, over at Convoso when it comes to that? Well, what Ryan said is uh, is correct. So what we uh, what we need to start moving to is building a cadence where we mix uh, text messages, phone calls, and emails in a way where it's more like a human, right? Don't call the same lead every hour, every half an hour, even though that's the most favorite thing some of these uh, call centers love to do. You know, mix it up. You know, the, with our system, you have something where call count one to two. You know, this is the uh, uh, increment of minutes or hours we wait and then as the call count uh, increases we wait longer and then maybe um, we add some automation where we take the data and let it rest for uh, you know a couple of weeks and then start calling them again and between that send a text message that makes sense based on the outcome of their previous call if it was an answering machine you can automatically uh, you know our system can see that it was an answering machine you know wait two minutes send a text message hey I just got the answering machine or maybe automatically leave a voicemail so our platform can mimic what a human uh, would do, and doing things like that makes the uh, makes the application more uh, personalized, right? It's, it doesn't look like it's a call center calling you. So, doing things like this also helps um, not uh, look like a robo dialer, even though uh, our customers aren't. It, it makes them seem that way if they keep pumping uh, calls after calls. So, mix it up, use a lot of different strategies um, to reach out to these customers, and I'm sure they'll appreciate it. You know, maybe somebody's busy all day long and they, take, they <clears throat> can't take phone calls. So send them a text message, you know, once, maybe three days later, send them another text message. Hey, I've been trying to get a hold of you. Um, you know, I, I've uh, already texted you once. And all of that can be built in a cadence. We know that we've already sent a text message once. So the second text message, we can say, like, you know, we, we sent you a text message three days ago. And it all looks like it's uh, coming from a human, even though it's automated through a uh, cadence system. So things like that will help uh, keep everybody happy, carriers, customers, and th that's what a lot of people need to move to. Um, I, I think that those are um, strategies B2B uh, companies use. And so for the B2C uh, uh, companies, I, I highly suggest start implementing those, you know, treat the customer like it's a business, don't annoy them. Annoy them. And uh, using that, you'll start seeing that uh, there'll be less blocking, uh, less head, you know, less complaints. And so that's, that, that's, you know, my two have cents. You, have you seen that there's like a number, like a threshold, like if I do three, that's when it's going to happen. Or are you still kind of monitoring and, and it's different by carrier? Um, you know, so when I looked at the data recently to see who's blocking what I, I saw about, um, it was interesting. There was a very sh small percentage where all carriers were blocking it. So I wasn't really able to find a pattern, um, but you know, like our office number was blocked or was uh, tagged as spam. Our our one of our local office numbers, which are not used to place many calls, you know, one of the desk phones that uh, uh, a IT person was using, they called me and and I saw spam, and I'm looking at at this. They haven't even used it to call a lot of uh, to place a lot of calls at, if anything at all. You know, like maybe like a couple of weeks. So. I, I can't see really a pattern um, to to how they're figuring this out. I mean, the biggest problem again is spoofing. If somebody spoofs my number, it doesn't matter what I do, that number is going to get flagged. Yeah, Michelle, um, I, I have a question for you. I mean, obviously, we talk on many subjects: TCPA, traced, which is included but separate, also. Um, uh, all of the things that are going on out in the world of telephone compliance and consumer protection. Is there a bottom to this? Is, it, you know, where do you see if you put your crystal ball in front of you and your magic hat on, which I know you own, um, uh, wh where are we going? <laughs> Talk uh, to the side, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what? Uh, that's the that's the million dollar question. There is so much going on in this area right now. I mean, right now we have cases that have declared the TCPA unconstitutional during the period of time that the government debt collection 
uh, exemption was part of the TCPA. Now two separate uh, two separate uh, district courts have have uh, ruled that, and we've got uh, the TCPA uh, face for Facebook versus Dugard uh, case in the Supreme Court that uh, is looking at the definition of ATDS and has the ability to make the definition so narrow that it would literally only involve uh, calls that uh, were placed using a random and sequential number generator. Uh, so I, there is so much going on in this area. Uh, I think it likely though that we will continue to see regulation even as things loosen there'll be another way that they are tightened uh, just because of the, the the fact that I started with and that's um, you know telemarketing calls that aren't wanted uh, that uh, aren't expected that are um, placed too many times uh, that are using a mode or a medium that the consumers don't want to receive messages uh, are the number one complaint, and regulators are going to continue to regulate that. Um, Congress is going to con continue to uh, look at, uh, you know, statutory enactments uh, to help eliminate uh, nuisance types of calls. So, you know, I have been encouraging the industry uh, for years that uh, self-regulation is really something that's got to be a part of all of these strategies above and beyond what the laws and regulations are requiring. Uh, you know, really considering, and uh, Bobby brought up some of those examples of ways that you can engage consumers in a way that's more friendly, knowing how they want to be contacted, when they want to be contacted, uh, the types of things they want to be contacted about. And, uh, you know, it's something we've been working on for a long time as an industry preference management, and it's something we really need to get, uh, get good at. Uh, so I, I don't know where the end is. All I know is that it's going to continue. And, uh, People are going to continue to market to consumers and uh, we'll continue to adapt and, and ways to conform with those regulations to make sure that we still can reach uh, our, uh, our customers. Ryan, do you see that any of this labeling and blocking is happening from non like power dialer platforms? So for example, I may have a list, but I pick up and manually dial or I pick up my cell phone and manually dial. Are those calls being subject to any of this activity? Or is it strictly yeah, absolutely? From I mean, oh, it yeah, is. any yeah, the, the customers we have an integration on like Salesforce, for example. So like a lot of our users are, you know, at home agents, right? And they're just going into Salesforce, and you know, they're using their you know local IDs that they have never thought about, you know, changing. And so it, it's a that's it's affecting the other you know any any kind of type of calls, which is really the odd part because you know six months ago or a while back, you didn't have such a you know, low velocity of calls that would all of a sudden get falsely labeled. And um, it can kind of creep up on you too. And like I said, you start, you know, wondering like, hey, is this something, what's wrong with the campaign? And, and then with like what Michelle said, there's not this common signal that comes back that tells you it's a blocked number. And so if you start getting a lot of busy numbers or disconnects or you hit these Nomo Robo blocking apps that play back a fake agent, um, you start marking your data incorrectly. And so then you start thinking, okay, I don't have, you have valid contacts. And so sometimes what companies will do is then they'll try to use a, another, you know, cell phone number and then they get through and they start having that aha moment that, hey, uh, maybe something else is going on. But um, it, it's just like when people ask me about TCPA and they go, well, I'm not using a dialer. What kind of risk is there? And it's like, well, the way it is with TCPA right now, anybody can sue you. And they can just claim, hey, you're using a dialer, then you have to defend yourself. And so, I mean, you kind of need to look, look at that angle as well. It's like, even if you're making manual calls, you're still going to have issues potentially around DNC. Um, you could have a professional litigator who try, could try to sue you. And depending on the way in which this Facebook case goes, I mean, you know, you could have a whole lot of more dialer technology now is allowable. Uh, if they kind of simplify the definition and remove the sequential dialing. And so, I think there's some things to watch. We're doing a webinar, I think November 10th, uh, on some of the post-election TCPA stuff that is worth turning into. But um, that question of the, we removed that situation, um, you really kind of want to look at um, not only your reputation, but like how you really vetted out the type of calling you're doing. Because I mean, I'm getting a lot of questions, customers who right now they're looking for all, like Bobby was saying, all these different channels that you can get get to people on, right? And one of them particularly keeps coming up is like ringless voicemail, for example, or you know, some of these 
things that, you know, is it legal or not? You really got to dig in and, and you've got to have legal vetting on that or have an outside counsel. Somebody understands CCPA because nothing against these platforms or against, you know, the, the folks that are out there that are pushing the technology, but um, you want to make sure what they're telling you is really not going to get you in hot water because everybody's got situational things with informational versus marketing messages versus reach back on customers. And at the end of the day, you got to expect somebody's going to challenge you for TCPA. Even if you're getting consent, they're going to claim they weren't home at the time or that it wasn't them, especially when they start thinking that, you know, they can collect 1500 bucks a call and they get their friends and family involved and make it a little more exciting. Mm. Yeah, but you have a follow-up to that, Michelle? No, We're it's almost just out of time, by the way. So I'm going to be wrapping up here in a second. But if there are any well, last comments, go ahead. No, it's just, uh, you know, what Ryan said is absolutely accurate. There are uh, folks out there that are setting up these types of calls, and it's just something uh, we have to be careful of. So uh, above and beyond what's going on with shake, shaking and stir. There are a few people who ask questions. Um, some of them were a little bit more complicated. Some of them, I think, were answered in uh, in other um, questions that I asked, and I did rephrase some of them to accommodate a combination of them. But we do have all of your questions um, in our control panel that we will get to as a post-show follow-up. In addition to that, once again, I want to remind people that they will be getting a post-show email with not only some of the answers to those questions, but a link to this and also a link to that co-shared ebook that we have. Um, I'm going to rapid fire this um, real quickly to our three panelists. I'm going to ask for any closing remarks. Once again, if I grab my microphone, you're running over. Please pay attention to my hand single. And also, how can they get a hold of you? I think that's also important, although it will be in the follow-up email. Give us a way to get a hold of you right now. Michelle, closing remarks, and how do I get a hold of you? Uh, contact your uh, carriers and your uh, service providers and make sure you are getting your calls through on the new stir shaken platform. You can get a hold of me at that information uh, right there. Awesome, at the bottom of your screen. Hopefully you can see that, Bobby. It's been a pleasure. Smile more. Hey, boys. There you go. <laughs> uh, Bobby, do you have any closing comments? I mean, obviously you run a platform. I mean, this is a big deal for you. It, it actually is as important as anything else. So uh, what would you have to say in closing? Um, use a vendor that is partnering up with, uh you know, these solutions and uh, these companies who who need to register them, you know, somebody that, that's on top of it. For us, lead gen is our uh, main, um, you know, customer base. So we actively make sure we integrate with whoever we need to. We monitor numbers. We look at what they are. We look for patterns. So uh, team up with a vendor if you're a lead gen company that uh, that's their primary customer and that's what they're, you know, who they're trying to protect. So. And then I think there's an email there, info at Combosa. <laughs> it is, uh, and I want to point out that if you do have a question that was unanswered and or have another question that you didn't ask, please send that to info at Comboso.com, and I know that Lisa and her team will uh, add that into our post-show follow-up. Ryan, I say the best for last. You are always the light of the show, um, the most colorful of all the people I talk to. Help us understand. What are your closing comments, and what would you like to leave people? Well, first off, uh, easiest way to get a hold of me is just Ryan at DNC.com. Um, and if you want to know anything about wine, I happen to live in wine country, so I can give you lots of good uh, tips if you're coming up to wine country. But beyond that, um, you know, I would say, look, you, you want to have a partner in, in a lot of this stuff, right? You know, trying to go out of your loan or come up with some strategy where you're shuffling numbers around or you've got some convoluted thing. At the end of the day, a lot of those strategies take time and energy. And, you know, if you're spending money on DIDs that you're not using, you know, you can definitely shrink down um, your budgets there. And if you really want to get down into the nuts and bolts of things, it's, it's worth it to, to look at the scoring in your numbers, get an idea on what we can provide or at least how we can help you on the white listing. And then, you know, if you need some, somebody to kind of look at your overall strategy with caller ID numbers, and you know, give you a third-party opinion or a third-party opinion about your dialing technology. Uh, we can definitely help out there. But it's just really about you know, look, we're all dealing with this at the same time as it evolves. You know, testing the waters and seeing you know how your numbers are scored and get an idea of how we we compare with you know Convosa or some of the other solutions out there. 
uh, it doesn't hurt anything. And it's, it's pretty lightweight on the tech side, right? We're not talking about getting into crazy APIs and things like that. It's simply a matter of just looking up and, you know, luckily there are some solutions out there because up until now, there's been, it's been very limited in what the, these analytics companies will tell the industry, right? They've kind of kept a lot of this data vaulted. And so now they're starting to trust us because, you know, like Bobby and uh, us, we're kind of vetting our customers out to make sure we know that they are, you know, legitimate entities because our, our, our necks are on the line too, right? We're, we're providing this information that somebody's doing it legally. Um, that doesn't help any of us. So, you know, making sure that you can get your calls through is just critical to sustaining the whole industry, whether it's uh, notifications, marketing calls, lead gen, or I mean, like, I, you know, Michelle was talking about, you know, you didn't get a notification that you had to get out of your house during these fires. Literally, you might only had a couple minutes and that can make all the difference. And it's, those that seem to be the things that the legislators do understand in terms of like why this is so bad because they're on the other side going, hey, I'm getting all these calls too. Why can't you guys stop these? You know, and they, they kind of group us together. So I think setting, setting some of those things aside so they have some clear examples is also helpful and you know, getting some of this uh, shifted off so we can get some safe harbors in place, I think is critical so that you know what's coming back from the carriers. I mean, it's only fair, um, in my opinion. Uh, one thing before we uh, ask, yeah, um, I'm just reading all these questions. Um, definitely, if anybody's uh, looking to figure out who these three vendors are, how to deal with them, uh, shoot, shoot us an email. We, we do have a, a relationship with them. And then as far as uh, stir shaking, there's a lot of great questions. I wish I could answer a lot of them, but definitely email us. Um, we can we can guide you guys in the right direction or just share any knowledge that we've, uh, you know, collected over the past couple of months uh, dealing with this. But yeah, there's a lot of great questions in there. We, we will definitely get to those and answer those in our post-show follow-up. Uh, we're running a little bit over, but I, uh, I think we booked that for Ryan just to, uh, so that he had a couple extra minutes to close up. I almost did this, but I didn't, Ryan. Thank you very much. Once again, uh, panelists, Michelle, Bobby, Ryan, thank you guys. This is our third time. I think I learned something new every time that is valuable. So I thank you for your time. I've enjoyed this. Once again, I'm Rob Seaver with Leeds Council. Join us or join over at leadscouncil.org. Check out what we're doing. And thank you for Convosa for hosting this and uh, for LeedsCon also for promoting this. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it, and uh, we'll see you guys soon. Thank you very much.